Welcome back to What is a Biology? I'm Mr. Johnny Hopkins, and today we're going to be talking about proteins, binding, degradation, and experimental techniques to study proteins. So, rather than get on into introduction, let's just dive right on in. First of all, proteins bind things. That's, that's their job. They bind something and they do something. In order to do something, they first must bind something. Okay, pretty, pretty straightforward stuff there. So they perform their function upon binding the target. And the targets that they bind are things called ligands. And a ligand can be anything from a small molecule to a different protein entirely. It's, it's this arbitrary term for just something that a protein binds. It can be an entire uh, chromosome of DNA. It's, it's very arbitrarily defined. It's just something that the protein binds. And so usually there's the idea of a um, lock and key model such that a protein can bind a specific target or a specific subset of um, similar ligands and similar looking molecules that allow them to act. And then upon binding, they will change the interface to bind such uh, ligand, like in this, and they will do something either to the ligand or it will change a different part of the protein, and then um, some functionality happens, some stuff occurs. Now, uh, where some stuff that can occur is um, uh, you have some different functions that can happen to the ligand. If this ligand is a different protein, the typical ones that you usually see are kinases and uh, phosphatases such that a protein can either throw on a, uh, a phosphate onto the protein itself, or it can actually remove a phosphate from the protein. And uh, the addition of these, uh, phosph these phosphates, or the removal, can change the activity of that ligand of protein. So that's something you can do to the ligand, but also um, since I said it can change its conformation, it can change a different part of the protein. And these uh, proteins typically are called allosteric. They have this allosteric, which allosteric is just a conformational change accompanying the ligand binding that's not directly related to the site. Because usually you have a small conformational change at the site to just kind of grab onto it, like your hand grabbing onto a jar of mayonnaise right before you go and grab the spoon to get yourself a nice, nice, just scoop. And so also proteins have multiple different, uh, some proteins can have different sites for binding. Hemoglobin, for example, has four sites that bind uh, oxygen. And then there's this idea of cooperativity. Cooperativity is just effectively if I put one oxygen onto, he onto the hemoglobin, does the binding of the other sites change? So you have positive cooperativity where if I throw uh, an oxygen at hemoglobin, then the hemoglobin will bind uh, oxygen even better at the unoccupied spots. And then negative cooperativity, which is essentially uh, the proteins kind of just slowly kick away, punch at any in oncoming uh, ligands to try and keep them away after single ligand binds. And this, these cooperativities actually help uh, modulate different cellular functions. So I just stated how, so we have proteins bind things, but how does it bind things? And what's the, how does it determine what it should determine? How, you, you know. Like, why, why does it bind? And then that uh, raises up this idea of how. What does the binding interface? I've previously stated before that the uh, outside of the protein is primarily hydrophilic. It's, it likes water. And that makes sense. The, the cell was pretty much made of water. It kind of just, it's, it's kind of water. But, does uh, having charged and polar residues at the um, outside of the protein allow for strong interactions? Let's just take a very simple physics, basic level, stupid approach that I uh, am quite fond of. Let's just subdivide a uh, protein into like a nine nanometer square um, binding interface. And we presume that it's either hydrophobic or entirely charged, such that it's flat, in charge or hydrophobic and can go up and down. 
So let's take this stupid idea. So we can have a, an arrangement of different charges uh, in this lattice of three uh, residues by three residues. And we can have a negative charge or a positive charge. And so what that happens is you have uh, nine different squares and they must be complementary towards each other to have a, a complementary binding interface for these proteins. And what that yields for the simple model is 256 pairs of proteins. So you can only have essentially 256 different interfaces for proteins to work together. That's not very specific. And also then if you take into account the fact that if we change, say, this guy to a positive charge, the positive and positive interaction won't separate the molecule. It will just kind of keep it. So in addition, we have this assumption that it would be uh, fairly flat, such that I could probably just take a molecular crowbar and Gordon Freeman and just stick it in there and um, unlatch the two. That, that doesn't make a lot of sense if you have charge. But now, let's take it if we have hydrophobic. If we have hydrophobic residues, what happens if we just presume that a residue, a, uh, an amino acid carrier, is just going to go straight up uh, anywhere from zero to four angstrom. So we kind of just say it can go, be either go from glycine, alanine, valine, leucine, and just goes from zero to four angstroms above the surface of that uh, alpha carbon. And so we just have like an interface like this that's three angstroms above, four angstroms above, zero angstroms above, so glycine. And we just have this arrangement on this, the uh, outside of the protein. And so then if you combine that to that, um, you have this, this complementary binding interface. Okay, that's kind of that's neat. Um, but um, walk. This, this is a basic, stupid uh, physics level approximation, but this yields um, 5 to the 9 different uh, combinations of proteins, so that yields about 1 million pairs of potential protein um, interactions. That is good. How many proteins are there in the human proteome? 25, 20 to 25,000. So this covers 20 to 25,000, and then if you take into account the possible um, interactions between these guys of whether or not um, whether or not they bind better, um, like if we just change this guy to a three or a two, it'll still bind quite similarly. But this is a very simple nine um, nine nanometer square idea, and in fact, protein. Uh, binding surfaces are quite a lot larger, but this just kind of shows you that hydrophobicity is the key to protein binding because it allows for specificity and fidelity of these binding interactions. So that's binding in a nutshell. But so what if a protein doesn't fold right? What if the protein is um, goes into its native state, jumping around, going, doing its job, punching and beating up um, random uh, bad proteins that are misbehaving or killing some viral DNA, you know, some, some strong guys like sea gas. But then unfortunately something kind of just bumps into it wrong at the uh, train station and then, bam, it's just lost its entire purpose in life and just gets unfolded and starts hurting the cell. What is up with that? So essentially, we can just, uh, we have a protein go from the unfolded state to the folded state, and then it goes out, it goes into this state, but it can't go back. So it goes into this intermediate uh, unfolded state, and it's actually harmful for the cell. So, how do we degrade this protein, or how do we get it back to its original form? We could use chaperones to try and fold it back, but that might be not so intuitive and difficult for the cell to do. So, there's this idea of um, how the cell regulates proteins. So, typically there are different proteins that will actually attack, that will find proteins that are um, unfolded, and then what they'll do is attach ubiquitin onto the end of these uh, proteins.
Pro, um, ubiquitin is a protein, it's a very small protein, it's less than 100 amino acids, it's this tiny little guy, I think it's 76, don't quote me on that, you can, you can Google it. Um, but, so ubiquitin, it just adds on these ubiquitins onto the end of the tail, because the tail, um, the usual idea is that it's unfolded, and so it's kind of just wiggling about, doing its thing, it's a, it's a wiggly boy tail. And this wiggly boy tail gets ubiquitin added onto it, and then if there's greater than four ubiquitins that are ligated, attached to it, um, it can get recognized by a proteasome. And a proteasome is just a giant protein that, unfold, that um, unfolds and degrades proteins. So if you take uh, clip XP, that's the typical one that we look at. It has a clip X and a clip P um, stuff. So if we take a wiggly boy and we shove it in there with some ubiquitins, it goes through clip X, which is a six, uh, six member ring, and that just pulls the guy through. Uh, just like those guys in Les Mis at the very beginning, just pulling that guy, um, pulling that boat in, and then there's clip P. And what that does is destroy the protein. So then it escapes into tiny little guys. So it breaks up this giant uh, unfolded peptide into several, diff several smaller peptides that can then be degraded into individual amino acids or um, used for the um, immune response with MHC complexes. We'll get to that in a, in a while. And there are also things called, um, uh, not prote proteases, which are not these fancy structures, but just little proteins that uh, degrade, uh, that slice up proteins at different points. They're just like a paramolecular scissors, but they're only those funky scissors, so you can only have you can only cut it the right place. You got trypsin, chemotrypsin, and elastase, that are the typical ones. And trypsin will cut right after an arginine or glycine, positive charge. And chemotrypsin, which will uh, cut right after phenylalanine, tyrosine, uh, valine, leucine, and isoleucine, uh, so hydrophobic residues. And finally, there's elastase, which uh, cuts at alanine and glycine, which are small hydrophobic residues. So, we can bind different proteins, and we can degrade proteins that are misbehaving and doing drugs. But now, that's, that's awesome. We have basic foundations of proteins, but how do we study proteins? Like, like it's cool that we, can, we, know, we, we know that these proteins do things, but how do people back in the 1800s, 1900s, early 1900s decide that proteins actually had these functions? And the answer is experiments. So we're going to go over some of the basic experiments here to try and understand what proteins, how we were able to understand proteins. First of all, SDS page. Sodium uh, dicosa sulfhydrol, something, fancy word, page, polyacrimate gel electrophoresis. So this is gel electrophoresis. Effectively, what happens is you take your protein and you put it into a well, and then, um, but usually it's um, a wiggly boy protein that you uh, deform it and you put it next to um, uh, some, some sample, a ladder of known protein lengths. And so, what happens is you can actually go and um, you put the gel under what, an electric field, and proteins typically have a negative charge when unfolded. Who knew that? And the protein will migrate down, and essentially it's this really rough terrain, and everyone's just trying to run to the finish line, but the bulkier the protein, the more it has to push through to try and get down to the um, finish line. So the bulkier the protein, the less, the le uh, uh, further up it is the less distance it travels. And so if you know like the molecular weight of your protein, you can uh, find, figure out where it is in the gel and using the, the ladder you use, and then you can find, hey, there's no protein. It exists. There's also a little bit of a uh, fancy technique that can be added to this, which is a Western blot, 
where you have uh, antibodies, which antibodies are just proteins that are very specific in binding. They have all that specificity and fidelity that I was just talking about. And so you have an uh, antibody that binds to a different antibody that binds to your protein. And then you get a very fancy strong band. All right. In addition, you can have a 2D gel. And a 2D gel is extra fancy. Rather than separating by molecular weight, you can also separate by the uh, pKa or pH of the protein. And so you effectively have a solution that um, has a different, uh, has a pH gradient, pI gradient. And, and um, so you equilibrate the proteins based on what their pKa is. And then you run the gel electrophoresis. Uh, so the electric field would be the opposite way. And then you can determine like the protein, the, the uh, samples, pHs and uh, masses. So nice stuff there. Now we're going to go into chromatography. This is a very similar method to kind of SES page, but it's, it's a little bit more interesting. Um, chromatography, everything is a column. Everything is a column. Everyone explains things as columns. It's, it's like we're living in the Greek world where we have to talk about these columns on this new architecture. It's, it's a little bit uh, annoying when you talk to someone who just only does these things because you're trying to figure out what, what they mean by a column. And the column is just something that separates out a sample. You have a sample go into a, um, a column, and then it comes out. It's, it's really just that simple. But not that simple. You have um, several different types of them, and rather uh, we'll just focus on two of them, because they're one most typically used. We have SEC and Affinity. SEC is size exclusion chromatography, where you use a column uh, that has a bunch of beads in it, and you have um, the idea is the uh, time of flight, or so you have a big bulky protein here and a small little peptide here. And so the big bulky protein will bounce into the um, uh, column and just kind of bump into these uh, beads and just kind of, you know, flow on through, tumbling about. But if you have a small, tiny peptide, it'll bounce against the bead and um, keep going and sometimes even enter the bead where it just kind of dawdles around loitering get when there's that no loitering sign and then they escape and they just kind of keep doing that and going in to these guys and eventually flowing out so this guy takes a lot longer than the big guy to come out which helps us uh, determine things like the size of the protein and uh, to and this is able to actually, we are able to directly use the sample right afterwards. Uh, whereas with SDS page, you typically don't extract your protein from the page or gel. This is more of a test. And then you have affinity, where um, you have these beads still, but rather um, what happens is quite the opposite is it can have antibody that binds to the protein on these beads, so that means it'll, it'll bind strongly to the protein, or you have a protein with a his tag that will bind to nickel, and so they will stay on top of, it will stay connected inside this column, and then usually you have an elution buffer that just strips it away from the um, nickel or the uh, antibody, and stripping that away, you get the same. You get your protein. Awesome. Now we're going to talk about fluorescence. Fluorescence is really simple, actually. Fluorescence: you shine a light on something, light comes out. Cool. Now the thing with fluorescence is. Um, you have a very short time scale of the uh, light coming out. So you have visible or UV light shine in on an aromatic residue, and that aromatic um, residue protein then will take that light. It will usually you can see diagrams something like this. 
where a um, where a pro where the electron essentially jumps up to a different energy mode and then it goes down a few vibrational modes um, and then this and emits the energy from dropping from the vibration modes into a light particle. So light comes in, it bounces and makes the uh, molecule jump up and down, jump up and down, and then shout out a different photon. And sometimes you get to deal with the uh, polarization of that, that's called anisotropy. But not really worth talking about because typically uh, people use FRET. And FRET usually is um, a way of telling the distance between residues. So I can kind of infer stuff about uh, protein conformations this way. You have a, um, you shine light in on a protein and, or on some aromatic region of the protein that is fluorescent, it shines in, that uh, it'll take an acceptor protein, it'll take, it, it'll take to the acceptor um, fluorophore, and that guy would bounce up and down, up and down, up and down, and then, uh, then tell everyone near it, oh my god, this is so exciting, it would get everyone else on the hype train for watching the new Snyder Cut or the new Marvel movie, get everyone else excited, they're starting to jump up and down and go crazy, so it affects this guy right next to it, that also is now jumping up and getting on this hype train for this awesome new Marvel movie that's coming out, and then it, that guy will scream and shout out and yell, um, some of these photons. And with that yelling at the photons, we can um, actually obtain an efficiency which can um, determine the distance or the radius between those two um, regions, which can tell us about the protein, by, uh, protein conformation. Awesome. You have things called radio labeling, um, where you can use a, where you can use a uh, radioactive isotope on these proteins that uh, to incorporate them in, and they can tell um, you can further purify with SDS page and do some other experiments. Uh, you have stop flow, where you take a sample of protein and its substrate or ligand, and then you uh, push them together. And you have a detector, and you can get the pre-steady state kinetics uh, from the sample. That's very very biochemical technique. So, all right, we can tell some stuff about the proteins now, but what if we want to get different information? What if we want to get the residue sequence? What if we want to get the primary structure, the amino acids? What if we want to know what this guy looks like? Like, it's cool to, to, to see stuff like this, but like, we don't even know what the protein looks like, and I've been pretty much nonstop talking about, ah, this protein looks like this. It looks like an angry man with a waffle iron just holding it and trying to punch somebody. Or it looks like a dog with an apricot in its mouth. But just because I've been talking about that means that there has to be some way to determine that. So that's where mass spec, x-ray, cryo-EM, and NMR come in. And mass spec can give you the primary sequence or modifications to the proteins such as those by the kinases and phosphatases as previously discussed. So mass spec, essentially what you do is you take your folded protein, you uh, usually will degrade it a bit by like, trypsin or chemotrypsin, and then it's into small little wiggly boys, and then you shoot those wiggly boys down, um, down a little tube, and then you can measure um, the frequency of these little uh, peptides in certain, uh, in certain regions, and then you can actually back map and backtrack it into an amino acid sequence, which is pretty neat stuff if you just think about it with using bioinformatics and magical computer science. It's magic. So then we can get the 3D structure uh, from X ray, crystallography, probably, and, and NMR. So first of all, we're going to start with NMR. NMR is a very, very um, finicky technique for proteins because you can, you're very limited. You can only do really small proteins. And effectively, the um, NMR, it just um, you can only look at the spin states 
of different molecules. You perturb the molecule with a magnetic field and you measure the relaxation at the signal. And so usually what you can do is you can do this tr thing called TROZI, where you can get the hydrogen and nitrogen uh, residues, hydrogen, nitrogen uh, from signals, and then you can construct the backbone of the protein, and then kind of just remind where everything else is alongside that. This takes a lot of, a lot of um, different experiments and techniques all coming together to try and determine where each of these residues is on this guy. Is this guy an isoleucine? Is this guy an alien? Um, trying to figure out which guy is which. Then we have cryo, we have, we have x-ray crystallography, sorry. X-ray crystallography, you uh, take a protein and then you uh, make it into a crystal, a fancy, fun little crystal that, um, and that is very difficult to do typically, making a crystal of some protein because it's, it's black magic. It is witch doctor um, type stuff. It is, and very, very difficult to do um, for a lot of different proteins because sometimes you need to just spin around three times, shout in the air, kumbaya, and then um, use a bidet for three weeks in order to get a protein to just magically work because it's, it's sometimes and, very difficult to crystallize proteins. And so once you get this protein, protein crystal, you shine some x-rays on it, and some x-rays uh, shine back out, and they can um, use some fancy analysis to determine uh, the structure from using some bioinformatic and physical tech, physical knowledge. And then you can obtain the 3D structure. Now cryo-EM is the easiest to understand in my opinion. And it's also possibly the most common technique these days to get the protein structure. It is just everything in biology that it, um, these days. So you have a sample, you just take a bunch of protein, you slap it onto um, this plate, and then you take a picture of the plate. Well, sorry, I'm forgetting a step. You freeze the plate down and make it really, really cold, and then you take some pictures of the plate, rotate it about, and then, like a fancy, you just fa do some fancy stuff, and you essentially just take a bunch of 2D snapshots and make it into a 3D image. That's, that's some fancy stuff right there. That's a computer vision. And so you take that 3D structure, and bam, you can tell about this protein. It's, it's pretty interesting technique. So. And then once you get the structure, you can surmise other stuff that you can test by fluorescence as well. So, it's, it's pretty cool stuff. So, all in all, I'm going to do a little quick summary. Uh, proteins bind things to do things. And that uh, binding interface is primarily hydrophobic because it allows for specificity and fidelity. Uh, and the, there are a lot of different functions of proteins. We have uh, some proteins that uh, degrade other proteins when they misfold. And when they misfold, they um, go through something like a prote proteasome, like the XP, that will degrade the protein because it's misbehaving and doing drugs. Now we have experimental methods. Uh, there's SDS page that allows you to get the molecular weight. There's a 2D page that allows you to get the molecular weight and PK proteins. You have uh, chromatography where you're able to uh, shine a protein through a column that will, uh, that will either bind tightly to the protein or um, cause it to elude out faster because of its size. And then you have fluorescence, which you shine light on protein, light come out. You have radio label, you have a uh, soft flow that allows you to get the pre steady state kinetics. And so you have mass spec, which allows you to obtain the uh, protein sequence as well as other information. Then you have uh, extra crystallography, cryo-EM, and NMR that allow you to get the structure. NMR is limited by protein size, as, and uh, cryo-EM is the most common typical method these days.
So that's all about proteins in general with this little unit. And next time we'll cover DNA, the fundamentals of it. I'm Mr. Johnny Hopkins. This has been What is a Biology? Thank you.